leadership, thank you so much for sitting and having this chat with me. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you and welcome to my home. Mm. After reading Joy mm. uh, in the spirit of the season, I mm. can't help but ask mm. if you continued with the 31st December ritual that Elizabeth mm -hmm. exposed you to. The scrubbing. Yes. <laughs> scrubbing and dusting and washing and making sure that nothing dirty from the previous year went into the new year. Just made sure that you couldn't sit up and wait <laughs> yeah. and do watch night. But of course, growing up, <laughs> we then started attending watch night services. But okay. 31st December has never been a pleasant day for me because of all the <laughs> scrubbing and dusting and whatever. Yeah. Mm. Is this something you expose your own children to? Oh, yes. Mm. But um, as time has gone by, I'm sure they found their own style. Right. Mm. Well, thank you for this, uh, because reading this is like knowing you, mm. knowing the historical context within which you grew mm. up, your life story, and there's even a connection with your personality. So thank you so much for In this. In broad strokes. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that every young girl should read this. Every oh. adult woman should read this. It makes a lot of difference. My daughter thought so. That's why I <laughs> allowed it to happen. Yeah. My daughter Nanekuya said, you must. And I said, I don't want to be. <laughs> But she said it will inspire other people, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm a, a sucker for that one. Right. So once she made those arguments, I said, if it will help somebody, why not? There are things that uh, you know, people would hear and be very mm. surprised. The mm. fact that you sing, mm. the, f the fact that you, you are into poetry mm. and you actually recited a few on GBC radio. Yes. You got your first paycheck yes. from that. Yes. Tell us how you were exposed to that. As I, uh, you must know, my father was at GBC and uh, there was this children's program hosted by Mrs. Hannah Dankwa Smith. God rest her soul. She passed on earlier this year. And so he told her about me and uh, she wanted to meet me and uh, so she, she put me on the program. I went more than once. There's one of the pictures there is of me as a 10 year old. Right. Did you see it on I, the wall? I must have missed it, but we're, we're capturing it. So okay. our viewers and our listeners will get a feel of it. So. I, 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 it was a picture from the radio and TV times right. that an uncle of mine who must have a sense of history, he'll be pleased to hear me say that, <laughs> kept the pictures. So ten, less than 10 years ago, he told me, do you know I have your picture from when you were in primary school and you went to GBC to recite? I said, you do? And she, he said, yes, I made a cutting. And he sent it to me. <laughs> and uh, so I scanned, photocopied, whatever. So now I have lots of copies of that one. And one of those is framed on the wall. Incredible. Mm. But I know the singing must have come from Elizabeth, your mom. Yes. And my dad too, actually. Okay. Wherever he went as a teacher, they, they were classmates. I'm sure you got that from me. Yes. So wherever he went as a teacher, he was a, a, a choir master in the Methodist church. If, if they had no choir, he started one. So um, they're singing in the family, yes. Mm. And it's, even when you went to Yale, you joined mm -hmm. the choir? Yes. That Are was you? the only way I could stay sane. <laughs> <laughs> but now you're no longer in the choir, but you're a patron. When I'm in Ghana, I don't find the time, unfortunately. Right. But um, I used to sing in the singing band because there you didn't need to attend um, rehearsals. Mm. So I joined the singing band in my church for a number of years, but uh, now they have enough members not to need part-timers <laughs> like me, so I no longer uh, sing with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, another thing that's close to you that's and indeed husband. the family mm. is the NSMQ. Yes. It's a, this contest is for the nation really, mm. but you were once a director. It's interesting, though, that your school, Wesley mm. High 
Uh, Wesley Gills mm. has never won it. Is no. this something that, that you worry about? It's a matter of practice and preparation. And I think the, the girls' schools have other challenges. You know, the kind of, uh, when I hear the kind of preparation and practice the boys' schools put their uh, contestants through, then I know it will be a, a challenge for the young women because mm. parents tend to want their daughters to come home during vacation. Right. Most of the contestants stay on in school mm. and uh, parents don't like that with their daughters. Right. So I think it's a matter of practice and uh, preparation and strategy. And uh, uh, the, the young ladies are every bit as uh, intelligent and capable as a, but with everything you need practice mm. and they just don't have the time right mm. is this something that you wish you could change i don't know about wishing to change you can wish on a star <laughs> i mean parents do i remember growing up you know, my, the first thing my parents would do when they went out and came home was to ask, where's Rita? So, I mean, I don't think they would have agreed that you should just stay on in school, preparing for a contest two years ahead, as the boys do. Mm. You know, so, um, I wish things were different, yeah. but... The, the, the world will not stop being round because you'd rather have a square world, you know. Right. So you, you take what you have and you go with it. Maybe someday it will happen. Maybe someday it will happen, yes. <laughs> but you, you pronounced your name. You just mentioned Rita. Mm. Henrietta. I'm mm. learning the right pronunciation. Mm. But it's fascinating from reading the book, I discovered where that name came from mm -hmm. because your parents got it from a play. Mm-hmm. How did you get to learn about it and have you watched the play? Well, my parents were classmates at Wesley College and they staged this uh, play, The Barretts of Wimpole Street. Incidentally, in Form 1 or Form 2, it was a literature book. Okay. Yes, and so mine isn't the only name from Barretts of Wimpole Street. My eldest brother, Octavius, or Oki. Oh. Oki comes from... And uh, Richard, Dr. Bamfo. His Richard also comes from the Barretts of Wimpole Street. <laughs> there were many of them. But the most famous, incidentally, is Elizabeth Barrett, who eloped with the poet Robert Browning. Right. So she's Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Uh -huh. And she's a famous English poet. Mm. What, is it, what is it with the play that all the children have something to do with it by way of where their names come from. They were classmates. <laughs> they did a play together in school. They loved it. They decided that they'd like to see those days. In our era, giving English names was the thing. Mm. So I suppose uh, in my father's family, every biblical name you can think of is there. So maybe he wanted to move away from uh, having to call me Mary or, or, or <laughs> Anna or something and, and right yeah so uh, but but it comes from their uh, school day and the and the play they acted in together so mm. Mm. one of the things the book also highlighted uh, you got a C in P mm. uh, that would soon change by the way mm. uh, because of your parents mm. but just wondering C and P, mm -hmm. 10 things around, soon became a champion in, in mm -hmm. athletics in your school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you got an, a first class in LLB at Lagos. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you had, even with all these achievements, you were still doing the housework. Mm -hmm. How did you manage that kind of balance, even as a young person? My mother was particular about keeping your surroundings clean and running a home. And, you know, so I grew up in a home. And uh, so some of the things were part of what you learned 
uh, growing up in, in a home. Now this see that I got in PE, what it did was to tilt, you see when your report came in, my father would take it and uh, the couple would discuss. Between the two of them, you could never set one against the other. <laughs> they were always on the same page on everything. So they must have discussed what to tell me. And uh, so my father took the report, counted how many A's and B's I had versus how many C's. And my mother said, you are not an average student, but this report is telling us you are an average student and we cannot accept that. And my father said, you even made a C in P. And I said, you see, but for that C, the balance would not have tilted. <laughs> and they were not impressed. Mm. And so they went through the report with me. And my father discovered that I had joined a lot of societies because in Wesley Girls, Forms 1 to 3, you couldn't join any society. But in Form 4, you could join any society. And I had mm. joined so many that according to him, I attended a society meeting every day and even Sundays and extras. And I said, no, that's not how it works. He says, well, that's what, that's the story the report mm. tells us. And so you have to choose. You can choose any two, but you shouldn't have to commit to more than two societies and society meetings every week. It means you are not spending enough time studying. Mm. And that's what I did. So that is the story of the PE. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always uh, as much of a sportswoman as I could manage. I represented Wesley Girls at uh, uh, Intaco throwing shot, the shot pot. Yeah, you weren't expecting my, that. Shot pot was <laughs> my event, and now I have a, a sore shoulder for it. <laughs> oh. And then I played hockey. You were captain of the hockey team. Which my father also played in school. Right. The, the initial Ghana hockey uh, team, mm -hmm. he was on it with Mr. Kenamwa. Right. The late Mr. Kenamwa of GDC. Right. Yes. So my father was very sporty in that way. My mother, no. You know, I'm asking this because a lot of uh, the young ones, mm. well, we're all guilty of it. We're on mm. social media a lot. Mm. Uh, but you did a bit of everything mm. and still you were excellent. Mm. How do you balance it today with social media? In our day, there was no social media. So, so um, maybe we are talking of different areas. And, right. uh, but uh, I was interested in those things and uh, when I wasn't interested I didn't do, uh, put in much effort so I suppose my interest had something to do with it and my mother was always uh, insistent that uh, she was bringing up an African woman mm. and I had to be an African woman so right. uh, housework uh, cleaning scrubbing my goodness and all of that was part of my, my, my upbringing. Mm. So um, I, I can't claim any credit, really, right. for getting things just right. I, I, I was just lucky. Mm. Well. I keep saying that for me, I don't call it luck. I call it the grace of God. And I've enjoyed plenty of it. Mm. God has been there for me at every point when something could have gone wrong. So uh, I, I feel a bit of a fake claiming credit for something over which I had no control. Somebody was out there looking out for me, that's all. Mm, right. Um, let's talk about your first national assignments mm. um, outside uh, this country, mm. even though you came back to also be on the... National Reconciliation Commission as a member. Let me tell you that my first national assignment was not what you think, but 
as a member of the legal committee of the National Commission of Experts. Right. I represented Ghana on the Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on mm -hmm. the uh, Declaration of Welfare, uh, the Rights and Welfare of the African Child. Right. So that was uh, when I stood out as a Ghanaian right. to represent the interests of Ghana and the Ghanaian child. Mm. And that committee, that legal committee did a lot. We initiated the conversations on child abuse and child labor and all of those things in the early 90s and interacted with the new district assemblies to draw their attention to the plight of children in their district assemblies. And don't, don't I'm sure it's no surprise to you that Ghana was the first to ratify mm. the, the rights of uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We had a lot to do with that. Right, yes. right. Well, so that was the first assignment, really, on oh. behalf of the children of Ghana. Yes. Right. Well, thanks to you, we've come a long way. Um, but the, the assignment that mm. I thought was the first national okay. assignment, I guess, was widely reported also. Uh, maybe that's why we skipped the very first national mm. assignment. But he also went on to be on the National Reconciliation commission. Committee. In fact, you were the youngest member yes. then to be on the commission. Uh, they nicknamed me Baby Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how, did you, how did you do it, really? You were a professor at the age of 45. You were on all these in, important commissions and committees. How do you think that happened for you? What happened was um, when I was tapped for it, I was a little nervous. Incidentally, the president now was the attorney general who called me to a sudden meeting. And I had just come home from uh, representing Ghana on the Lockerbie uh, the, o the OAU committee mm. on Lockerbie. So I thought that was what um, the Attorney General wanted to report to Cabinet about because he said he needed to see me, he was going to Cabinet. So I thought he was going to report on Ghana's position on Lockerbie. So I took all the extra reports thinking that maybe what I submitted through the ministry hadn't reached him. And I got there and he said, the President says to tell you that uh, you should serve on this committee. I said, no, I'm too young. And he said, well, President Kufour thinks the young people of Ghana also need to be represented. Because <laughs> I thought it was for uh, very senior people. So that's how I got on. And that told me that uh, the nature of it was going to be difficult to combine with anything. So I took a sabbatical. Oh, yeah. I was due for a sabbatical anyway, but had not planned to, to take it. But when that happened, then I applied formally to take a sabbatical. So mm. I was on sabbatical leave for the period. Right. But I had to teach because we were short-staffed. So I, I did extra teaching uh, just to keep things going at the faculty. But I was on sabbatical leave officially. Right. One of the important committees, I guess, would be the education review, mm. uh, of which you're a member of. Mm. And I can't help but ask, uh, because of the work that you did, mm. the quality of education today, particularly mm. in the tertiary mm. um, education level, is that what the plan was? Is that what you envisaged? This is the Anamoa Committee, Anamoa Mensa mm -hmm. Committee. And um, you see, some things steal upon you if you don't take care. So suddenly there was an explosion and everybody wanted tertiary education, which is good because in the past, uh, the international organizations we dealt with thought that people should have primary education. And I remember um, personalities like uh, Dr. Okonjo Iwiala saying, that she had got to where she had got to, not because of primary education, but because of tertiary education. Mm. So the need to switch around our focus so that people could have tertiary education uh, became preeminent. The problem with 
the educational system is that it's a social good. So some things can steal up on you. We used to have um, what they called, I forget what the name is now, it was the Ministry of Finance, but it was like they tried to match our, our human resource needs. Those days they called mm -hmm. it manpower something something. But uh, I think at, at some point we abandoned it. Unfortunately, I think although we had adopted, I was a member of committees on campus, we had adopted uh, 40, 60 percent in favor of science because we were producing too many arts graduates. But when there was the explosion in the tertiary sector, I think too many of the private institutions went in the direction of uh, the general arts uh, system, which is not as expensive as mm. science. And so uh, I believe that's been part of the difficulties we've had, that we have so many uh, people with qualifications in the arts, and there's a death of science-based um, disciplines. Right. But I think we'll, we'll get it right at, uh, uh, as we go on. Mm. So you wanted to know what I think of it? I think every generation produces what it is capable of producing. Our students are still doing very well when they go abroad to other universities in the same way as in my generation. Mm. So who am I to say that their quality is lower? Right. It may be different, but it may be dictated by the needs of the time. Mm. Now they, they have all these social media outlets to help. They have all these computers. In our day, we literally slept in the law library. In their day, they have most of the materials they need on their laptops. Mm. The difference is that we went to the library to read because there was no other option. They think they have the material on their laptops, so they know it. And I have been constantly cajoling them that having it in your room is not equivalent to having it in your head. Mm. So I think making the jump between having it ready on hand and reading it has been a challenge for some. Right. Yeah. Are you surprised that we have all these numbers wanting to read law? No, not surprised. You see, all these... Uh, bright young people, mostly young men, appearing on TV and throwing around theories. Uh, uh, it's bound to uh, make law look fascinating. It has always been, I must say, but now it's even more fascinating. Mm. In our parents' generation, and I suppose in mine, many people read law while working so that when they retired from the public service they could have careers in law but i think the young people now their aims may be different mm. but i suspect that seeing all these jazzy uh, looking young people throwing around big words and yeah. big ideas <laughs> and so on has to have some attraction mm. uh, for, for, for young people. So maybe that's the reason. How was it in, in, in your, well, maybe your, your time and um, years after? Because mm. uh, recently when over 800 students were called to the bar, mm. young lawyers were called to the bar, uh, it made a, a huge buzz. People mm. were posting lawyers and people were looking for lawyers who had graduated to post. Mm -hmm. How were you celebrating it in your days? In our day, Call to the bar. life was very different. In, I think my, in my class, we may have been maybe a little over 60 mm. called to the bar. We had had a disturbed year going to carry cocoa and all of that. I'm not complaining because <laughs> I was able to have my second child in peace. <laughs> So we were called to the bar in December. Hmm. And uh, 
And in those days, the call was held in the Chief Justice's court, which is a much smaller court than the, what the Supreme Court. I think it was remodeled and expanded and so on. But in those days, the call was in the court, in the courtroom. And uh, it was a small event. You took it, you celebrated. Uh, I remember cooking for a few uh, people. I loved to cook. Mm -hmm. These days, I don't cook anymore. But cooking was my hobby, really. And I took cookery for all levels. So uh, I remember having a, a little dinner party for my friends and family who had come. But those days, it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> those days, it wasn't a big deal. Right.